See, David, we were just about to give up on you. Well, welcome back, everyone. And uh, I'll ask you, please, to go ahead and resume your seats. Uh, my name is Ken Ledford, and I'm a historian and lawyer here at Case Western Reserve. And it's with Bob Strassfeld's general sense of irony that uh, he put me in charge of a panel where I would like to talk about the expansiveness of surveillance over time, uh, uh, which fits into some of my work in Germany in the 19th century. But instead, uh, the next panel is about the discussion, it continues our discussion about uh, surveillance over space. Clearly, space has emerged as sort of a dominant theme so far. Uh, last night, we watched surveillance in a four-room apartment uh, in East Berlin. We've talked about public and neighborhood space in the District of Columbia, digital space and privacy in the European Union, and space in the sense of closed-circuit televisions and protester pens uh, in Vancouver. Uh, this panel on globalization and surveillance presumably is about the ultimate space, uh, uh, that which is global. Uh, and we have two speakers who are going to talk about the challenges of the totalizing appetites of the surveillance state and the surveillance society and the global scale of the preventive needs to secure the homeland in an era of world terrorism. Uh, I'm going to introduce both speakers briefly. Their full biographies are in uh, the booklet that you have. And then I'm simply going to keep, keep time thereafter uh, and let them succeed each other. Our first speaker is David Lyon of Queen's University uh, in nearby Kingston, Ontario, who is indeed one of the founders of the field of surveillance studies. Uh, our second speaker will be Paul Rosenzweig, uh, now in the private sector and in education, but who in the last administration had actual responsibility for homeland security in a variety of positions in that newly created department. Uh, David will talk about the surveillance society, and Paul will talk about the challenges, as you see here, uh, of data valence uh, in the global era of terrorism. So, David? Thank you for your welcome. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to just make some comments about uh, modes of identification. That's the focus that I want us to have this morning. Um, and I'll try to be as historical as I can after that um, introduction. Identification systems are exploding all the way around the world. Indeed, uh, I think it's appropriate to talk about the globalization of the means of national identification, which little um, ironic comment could uh, keep you going for the next 20 minutes if you don't want to think about what I'm saying. That in itself, it seems to me, is rather interesting. Um, in the United States and Canada, we have um, societies that are among all the countries of the world, least enthusiastic about the possibilities of carrying national identification cards. However, in Canada and the United States, we are also those who carry on our persons more forms of identification than any others in any other country of the world. So there's another curious paradox for you there. Um, and of course, especially since 9-11, there have been uh, several attempts in both the United States and Canada to uh, produce modes of uh, identification, modes of national identification, uh, not under that name uh, in the United States or in Canada. Uh, the so-called Real ID program was the uh, main effort to that end. Uh, and now even that term is being officially dropped in the uh, United States. And uh, for border crossing purposes in Canada, in several provinces, we now have uh, enhanced driver's licenses. And that's the nearest that we get to, to an official national identification system. However, um, 
These programs are developing around the world. And in Canada and the States, we are part of that development, whether or not we actually have something called a national identification card. So let's move out of the local and uh, think much more globally, because I'm not just talking about the countries of the affluent global north. I'm talking about countries in the global south as well. Uh, countries that are purportedly democratic and those that are not. Countries that are exceedingly rich and others that are definitely not. So that if you go through the list, it's a very long list of countries that are trying to develop or have developed or have rolled out uh, identification card systems that carry biometrics and that are that use electronic databases as their means of maintaining the registration system and of uh, exchanging information uh, on individuals and groups under particular circumstances. The, the uh, list is a long one. Uh, just this year, Angola, for example, uh, rolled out a system. Ghana tried to roll out a system. It's, it's not working too well, but um, it will likely uh, come into being. Nigeria. Uh, South Africa has uh, tried more than once, and again, there are ironies there too, given the uh, dominance of the passbook system to uh, the apartheid regime until 94. Um, and in Latin America too, you find uh, the development or the building on old systems of, by new ones uh, in countries like Bolivia, Argentina, uh, Brazil. Um, and, um, and in Mexico this year, uh, a new system was uh, announced. That one, of course, is part of the uh, so-called um, Security and Prosperity Partnership between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, uh, of which we could speak in question time. It's a particularly interesting case. Um, but yeah, all around the world, there are new ID systems developing. Why is this? What is the reason behind this globalization of a particular form of surveillance and, I would argue, a central dimension of surveillance, identification? Well, it's because um, identification has become a key means of governance in the contemporary world, by which I don't mean only governance by uh, departments of a nation state, but governance through uh, employment regimes, through consumer regimes, in many other contexts as well. I'm using governance in a, in a broad sense. <coughs> Identification has become crucial to governance. Put another way, the production of some form of legitimate ID has become essential to exercising freedom in the modern world. So whichever way you look at it, these modes of identification have become crucial and for particular reasons, the fact that we increasingly live within uh, societies that are information dependent and uh, have information infrastructures, and that uh, there have been uh, increasing demands for, great, for, for more accurate uh, veri verification uh, regimes, the biometrics have been uh, introduced. So for all these reasons then, I think the topic that we're examining is a particularly important one. And I just want to make some comments about three aspects of uh, IDs. Surveillance, security, and citizenship. Each of which, as you can guess, has something to do with uh, ID systems. Surveillance, first of all. Carrying forms of ID allows for greater transparency of the subject, of the person, to whatever organization it is that uh, uh, has arranged for that system to be put in place. Um, again, put it the other way around, it enables organizations to see those who are part of their uh, responsibility um, or their uh, jurisdiction. It enables them to see better. James Scott has a book called Seeing Like a State, and identification card systems help the state 
and other organizations to see better. It increases the visibility of um, those who are the citizens of uh, a given nation state. It, through maintaining records, through updating those records, through continually connecting those records with the uh, real life people to whom they refer, uh, the state can see better. Surveillance is in a very close relationship with uh, identification, as I say, um, and surveillance itself has, in the last 20 years or so, become a key organizational mode. In fact, uh, I would argue that surveillance has become the preferred organizational mode for all kinds of organizations in the uh, contemporary world. That is to say, the uh, systematic focused attention to personal details for some specific purposes such as uh, management, control, entitlement, care, protection, influence, whatever those purposes might be, are achieved through uh, means that have increasingly been computerized and uh, have become the subject of uh, electronic databases. So surveillance has become the uh, preferred organizational mode, and within that, modes of identification and verification uh, are crucial. And so, in a sense, um, one has to say that it's not the it's not the card. I mean, we all carry these things. Um, I don't know which one. Well, here's one that I thought I might have to use at the swimming pool this morning to show that I belong to some university uh, physical recreation centre. They didn't even ask for a card as it happens, but um, there's there's one that uh, you know has a little barcode and. Um, has my photo ID on it, and, and so they can, they can check who's, uh, who's been there. We, we carry these things, but together they add up to a very sophisticated dimension of uh, surveillance systems. But it isn't the card that matters. So often when people start getting anxious about uh, producing ID cards, they think that uh, national ID cards, they think it's the card that is the crucial thing. <laughs> Uh, what if I have to produce this wherever I happen to be? Uh, we've turned this into a kind of police state. The police can ask me for my ID wherever I am. That's the sort of thing that, especially in Canada and the States, we want to avoid. But it's not really the card. It's the database to which the card refers. It's not that piece of plastic. It's the screen. And that is a crucial uh, dimension of what we have to consider if we're thinking about ID as surveillance. It's the screen that produces whatever security uh, successes or whatever life chances and opportunity uh, quotients are available using that card. It's the screen, it's the database, it's not the card itself. And I'm going to explain a little bit more why that uh, is, is the case. So let me say a little bit about uh, the development of these cards. These cards are the product not merely of, uh, in, in the case of national IDs, not merely of a nation state. They are the product of what I call the card cartel, which is a shorthand form uh, for saying the oligopolization of the means of identification. I think that identification, as I say, has become crucial to governance. Governance is primarily carried out by surveillance. And the production of these things is, produ is, is uh, due to, yes, government departments, but also large corporations. And the protocols, and if they're agreed internationally, standards that govern these systems. And the three working in conjunction with each other provide the backdrop, provide the productive dynamic for the card systems. We are definitely not in a world where uh, a government department is capable of producing an ID card system. They are completely dependent upon the uh, corporations that uh, produce these systems for them. And the corporations, in turn, uh, 
come to decisions about the protocols that uh, enable the machines, the systems to talk to each other and uh, as they become standards, such as through the uh, ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, um, they have standards that determine uh, what sorts of protocols are appropriate. So together they produce this. It isn't just a question then of the card between the state and the citizen. The card cartel is uh, important in there. Nor is it just the citizen, as uh, I will come to explain a bit further. The citizen is now uh, increasingly seen as a member of certain kinds of categories. And that is crucial to surveillance, because surveillance done by databases has everything to do with social sorting. It has to do with um, making those records and with those records putting people into categories or putting those data into categories so that the categories, categories can be treated differently. Now, perfectly logical bureaucratic process. But what has happened in the shift, here's another bit of history, in the shift from file-based systems such as you would see on uh, the lives of others through to electronics-based systems is that the social sorting capacity has come to the fore. The capacity to sort through files, very difficult indeed when you're talking about uh, physical paper files. When you are talking about electronic files, the capacity to sort and to place people in categories and to treat those categories differently comes to, uh, it becomes very easy indeed. And moreover, whereas there has always in bureaucratic organization been a categorization process going on, the categories by and large that mattered were ones that were publicly available. Within electronic database systems, increasingly the criteria by which you get put in one category or another are murky and opaque and very difficult to understand. So, uh, identification systems and surveillance. How are we doing for time? You're doing well. Well, how much more? Um, <laughs> seven minutes. Oh. Okay. Just a uh, decision as to whether to talk about the other two points or just focus on this one. Um, let me say, too, that identification systems and surveillance in general are always ambiguous. Uh, someone outside at the, uh, in a coffee area just asked me whether I was for surveillance. I don't believe that there is any such thing as being for or against surveillance. Surveillance is a human activity. It is as old as the hills. It is just that in the present day we have very particular forms of surveillance. When it comes to identification systems, let me suggest to you that rather than being inimical to human rights and civil liberties, some registration and uh, uh, identification systems are absolutely crucial for the maintenance of human rights and civil liberties. If you're a Tibetan in Nepal, if you're a uh, worker from Turkey, a gas arbeiter in Germany, if you are uh, a poor worker in Argentina who hasn't got an ID, the police won't take a blind bit of notice of your complaints about your abusive employer. National registration and identification can be a crucial tool of democratic governance and uh, for citizens to actually uh, hold and uh, be able to manipulate their rights and their uh, liberties. So it's a highly ambiguous world and uh, I make no claims to being either pro or against identification and surveillance, which doesn't mean to say that I'm not exceedingly critical of some registration, identification and surveillance systems. I am. Uh, one of the key rationales that has developed over the past few years for new identification systems is security, by which is generally meant national security. Now, national security has to do with the uh, securing of borders from external threats by political or military means. And that has become the uh, pri political priority in a number of countries, and especially, and above all, in the United States. 
indeed, in some countries, it has reached the uh, not just priority uh, level, but it has become an idolatrous obsession. And it has to do not only with international relations, but also with urban security and uh, the relationship between external and internal has become more and more blurred so that what goes on inside a given country, a given territory, uh, is, is blurred with what's going on outside so that the external threat can be confused with the internal threat. And again, I'll give you some examples of that if uh, you like in question time. There's also an important shift that has taken place within this notion of security, which is a shift uh, in surveillance systems for security from the past tense to the future tense, by which I mean that where once past uh, records of behaviors and activities and allegiances and so on and so forth were the crucial item. Increasingly today, the emphasis is on the future. The future tense has taken over with uh, ideas of prediction and preemption, prevention before the act. It's true of some of the uh, beliefs behind CCTV that we were considering earlier. It's especially true of identification systems. To try to stop bodies entering certain spaces, to try to stop access to uh, virtual spaces as well as physical spaces. Uh, the incalculable risks that are uh, said to be presented to us today are now being incorporated into the algorithms for attempting to uh, provide and maintain security. And that uh, future tense, again, is a crucially important historical shift from uh, a mere interest in past records or the possibility of um, uh, maintaining security through an understanding of who is present and who is not. Just a point in passing, national security as a concept varies radically from country to country. Uh, Mexico, again, would be a case in point. The understanding of national security in Mexico, whatever uh, homeland security in the United States would like to think, has no connection with the sorts of priorities that are present in the United States. It has much more to do with uh, opposition to corruption, to drug cartels, to urban violence, and so on and so forth. A very different understanding is uh, available in the African countries, uh, Latin American countries uh, that I mentioned as well. Let me just make a brief note too about the uh, ways in which it's not only from country to country that there is uh, a shift but um, also historically there's a shift. The notion of security had once to do uh, in the wartime years in the middle of last century and afterwards to do with what might be called population security or social security. It had to do with quite different matters from the idea of external threats to uh, territories. It had to do with uh, the provision of full and fair distribution of resources for human flourishing across a population. Other concepts of security have uh, come to prominence too in, uh, in this century, the notion of human security, where freedom from what, but also freedom from fear is seen as uh, a crucial dimension of, uh, of human security. So there are very different understandings of security that we could engage and which would make a difference to the way in which we set up our surveillance systems and our identification systems. Lastly, citizenship. National ID systems obviously have uh, citizenship data within them and relate to uh, citizenship. Citizenship in the United States and in other Western countries was once uh, thought of as that means of opposing arbitrary rule and uh, giving the means of holding government accountable. Well, I'll leave that with you because uh, I, I think there are certain ironies there too. It now, in the forms of identification that I've been referring to, it now uh, 
is the case that citizenship is seen not so much in those inclusive terms, but through the lens of the uh, sorting systems that I've been trying to describe, that are intended to exclude particular groups rather than to be fully inclusive of all. The whole point is to ensure that certain kinds of categories are not permitted access, uh, either virtual or physical. I said a few minutes ago that the card is not significant. Well, that's not quite what I said. The card is not half as crucial as the database. The card is also significant. In every country where um, ID cards of the kinds that I've been describing have been developed, and uh, you can see many of these cards on a little website that we've set up called uh, uh, nationalidcards.org, uh, then um, you will see that they're all of a similar shape, a very familiar shape. They all look like credit cards. They speak to us, culturally, of the development of the consumer citizen. And of course, many of the cards that have been developed have been developed with the capacity to be used for commercial, such as banking, purposes, as well as those that have to do with um, security or uh, access or whatever. Okay, I see my time is up. Um, I think that's enough to keep us going for uh, discussion. I do want to make some comments about the uh, relevance of this for or, or how relevant privacy is to thinking about these questions and some comments about uh, the extent to which uh, there is a possibility of shaping or altering the direction of these systems. But those can be kept for question time. Thanks very much. Let's see if we can restart this thing. Probably not. He can't. He can't. He's got to unlock it. Before Maxi begins, I will uh, begin with a short apology for this, which is to say that in this discussion, I want to simplify uh, both some computer concepts and some legal concepts. Um, I hope everybody will bear with me. Uh, you can't really get into too much detail in 20 minutes, so I, I want to acknowledge right up front that some of these are simplified thoughts. Um, We've spoken today uh, so far about uh, audio surveillance, uh, CCT surveillance, uh, uh, a panel today, this afternoon will talk about wiretapping. I want to talk about a different type of, of, of surveillance, one that's pretty uh, new. It's kind of uh, relatively new in concept and of concern. I, I, I call it data valence. Uh, some call it data analysis. Um, it has come to the forefront. Uh, in American thought mostly as a product of 9-11. It is underlying what we mean when we say uh, connecting the dots. You know, the 9-11 Commission has said that uh, the great failure of September 2001 was the failure to connect the dots, to share information across disparate databases. And um, an entire program of government activity called the information sharing environment has been developed by Congress and is being implemented today that is an, an attempt to cure uh, that failure. Um, to say that we uh, haven't, didn't connect the dots is a, is a commonplace. Almost everybody has heard that phrase. Um, but in thinking about the power of this and the utility of this type of technology, as well as its peril, I think it's often useful to kind of go back and actually uh, describe what that means in terms of 9-11. Of uh, this data from the next few slides is out of the 9-11 Commission report and something called the Technology and Privacy Advisory Committee that was commissioned by the Department of Defense. Uh, I also, intellectual property alert, I didn't build the slides. My friend Jeff Jonas at IBM built these particular slides. But this is what the 9-11 Commission actually means when it says we didn't connect the dots. Um, you know, back uh, uh, before August of 2001, there were two people who later became 9-11 terrorists, uh, Al-Hamzi and Al-Nadar, who were actually on an INS watch list. And then, uh, in late August, they made uh, plane reservations for the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the four flights that crashed into, uh, that eventually crashed into the World Trade Center. Yeah. Had we had a system that actually compared plane reservation data with the INS watch list, 
we would have successfully been able to identify at least two of the 9-11 terrorists. But that wouldn't have been it, because these reservations were used, and they gave um, addresses, uh, two addresses uh, that, uh, that they used to, as part of the reservation system, right? Uh, those two addresses were also used by three other uh, <coughs> individuals who became 9-11 uh, terrorists, Atta, Asheri, and, Al and, and Salem al-Hamzi. So had we been able to make a simple connection based upon the addresses uh, that they gave in their airline reservation, we would now have had five of the 9-11 terrorists easily identified. Likewise, Atta, who has now been identified through his common address, gave a Florida telephone number to go with his address, right? That same number was used by one, two, three, four, five of the other terrorists, also as their callback number uh, for, uh, for their airplane reservations. A simple comparison of that information would have now allowed us to identify 10 of the 9-11 uh, uh, hijackers, right? And then uh, one of them, one of these uh, uh, 10, uh, Al-Madar, actually used a frequent flyer number. It remains a, an unsurpassed puzzle to me why any terrorist who intends to kill himself would be collecting frequent flyer miles for future use. Um, and they don't do it much anymore because they now know that we can follow this. But uh, nonetheless, that frequent flyer number was also used by Majib Mokdeh. And so we had 11 of them identified. Now, all of this is based solely on information that they voluntarily provided to the airlines as part of making these uh, airline reservations, right? Now we can start a second chain, right, uh, using what are called public records connections, which are simple things like where you live in, and, you know, the telephone book, right? Uh, two of the subjects uh, lived with uh, with uh, Hanjur, and one of them shared a P.O. box with Satani. So now we've got this many of them, right? And then we, start an, uh, we do have to start one other chain. That's as far as we can get with that one list. But if we actually were looking at uh, the list of people who have expired visas, that is people who've overstayed their, uh, overstayed their uh, visas or something like that, and cross-checking that against flights, uh, we would see that al Ghamdi. Uh, Ahmed al Ghamdi, and I apologize, I don't do very well with these names, um, had also made a flight reservation that, other, that others of these terrorists were on, right? And he shared uh, both uh, addresses uh, or, uh, or crisscross matches on, f when it says has or does live with, that's usually a, an indication that it's a crisscross match through a telephone record. <coughs> they used to share a phone number that led to a common address. And that leaves us with all 19 of them. Uh, readily identified through very simple uh, public database searches of this sort. Now, in essence, what you can do is with just seven clicks of the mouse. Now, granted, it takes a little longer than that, but with just seven clicks of the mouse, one conceivably uh, could have identified all of the 9-11 terrorists before they got on the plane. You can see why um, that animates a government, right? Uh, that, this is now after the fact, and a lot of people have been held accountable for failing to do this. A lot of people uh, lost their jobs. Some of them got Presidential Medals of Freedom, but that's a, also another story altogether. But a lot of people look back on this and in retrospect say, what did we do wrong? How did we not uh, see this? Now, the power of this tool is driven by a couple of trends that are useful to kind of go back and think about. The first of these is one that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's, uh, it's Moore's Law. Uh, Moore's Law is a simple, uh, is a simple commonplace. It was coined back in 1965 by a guy named Gerald Moore, who was then working for Intel. And he posited way back then that the power of chip capacity to do computing would double every 18 to 24 months. And as that chart shows, he's right, right? That's pretty much a straight line, uh, and it has been going on since 1970. Uh, notice that the scale on the right is logarithmic. So every box is a tenfold increase in power. Uh, what that means is that today, computers are about, about 10 million times as powerful as they were back in 1970. The computing power is that, and computing power is basically a, a proxy for speed of processing. So computers today can 
process 10 million bits of information in the same time it took to process one piece of information in 1970, or it can process um, the same one piece 10 million times faster, whichever one you want to do. Um, and that's led to great things. It's what makes Google and, and Amazon and Walmart all possible. It also means that natural language search engines like your Google search are a reality. Uh, if we didn't have this kind of great power, we couldn't get that far. So, so that's one of the things that, that is happening in, in the world. And by the way, um, though computer scientists will tell you that they, they know that it can't keep doubling for infinity, right? that we're never going to get to an infinite s speed, um, none of them see any limit in the very near future. This is going to go on for the next five, ten years, they think, uh, without limitation. The other thing that is happening, and this is the exact opposite curve, and again, it's a, um, it's a logarithmic scale, is this is the cost of data storage going down exponentially, uh, doubling or, or having about every, uh, every six to 12 months. What that means is back in 1984, it cost roughly $200 to store a megabyte of data. Today, you can store 100 megabytes of data for a penny. Um, just last week, I bought a one terabyte uh, desktop storage thing for, for my desktop to back up my laptop in case my laptop crashes. Um, I have read estimates that back in 1980, the entire governmental data holdings of the United States government were on the order of a terabyte. Now, nobody really knows that. You can't, that's, a, that's not verifiable. So that's kind of anecdotal because nobody measured it. But rough, rough order of magnitude, I can put the entire US government from 1980 on my desktop today. right? Um, so in effect, uh, we are imagining a world where we are able to store and process tera, peta, um, yodabytes. Yodabytes is, you know, is down the road a bit of information with, at virtually no cost. Um, the limits is, are only in the imagination of our search algorithms. And we are being forced to ask, what happens when ever quicker processing power meets ever cheaper storage capacity? And that's what's driving the ability to think about being able to do this connection of the dots. Um, one example, well, looking back 10 years ago on this, uh, 10 years ago, looking, back, looking at this, Scott McNeely of Sun Microsystems said privacy is dead. I think he got it a little wrong uh, because a lot of the privacy that you do in your own home that you don't put on the computers isn't. But what he did mean, and I agree with Michael who said it earlier, is public anonymity is dying. Uh, because you are leaving trails of what you do in cyberspace that can be tracked for an infinite amount of time. Interestingly, since this is a, a legal uh, group, uh, I, I ought to talk a little bit about law. Uh, we, um, the law had a concept for this idea that computers couldn't do uh, great data searches very readily. It was a concept called practical obscurity. And it was actually identified in a Supreme Court case back in 1989, which is the dawn of computer time, right? Way back when. Um, uh, it's a fascinating kind of concept. Uh, at that time, uh, police records about individuals who'd been subject to arrest or, or had warrants issued for them or had been charged and charged not and charges dismissed were spread about. You'd have to go to the police blotter to get the arrest record. You'd have to go to the DA's office to get the charging documents. You'd have to go to the courts to get the conviction and sentencing documents. And at very great expense to itself, the Department of Justice began the process of collecting all of this public data into a single database, which eventually became what we now know as the National Criminal Information Center uh, system. Right? Uh, and so they went to a lot of trouble to do it. And some very smart uh, reporters, uh, this actually gets back to the interesting uh, twist between privacy and, uh, and free speech and journalism. Some very enter enterprising reporters went to the Department of Justice and filed a FOIA request for the collected uh, arrest records of this mafia Don who lived in Philadelphia. And uh, their argument, which had a great deal of force, was, look, these are all private records. We could go to the trouble of going to the Philadelphia Police uh, Center and to the Philadelphia DA's office and the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas and the federal court and collect it all. But you've already done it already. They don't lose their uh, public character as records simply because the US government has collected them in one place. And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, uniting everybody from Brennan to Rehnquist, uh, said, no, you're wrong, right? There's a vast difference between what's in the public eye but in these disparate databases that can't be collected and what is in some centralized place. There is a privacy interest in maintaining the practical obscurity of the rap sheet, 
right? That was 1989, right? Today, uh, private companies like Axiom, Experian, ChoicePoint, LexisNexis have do this routinely. They hire retirees uh, to go and actually copy the records out of the North Carolina courthouse and uh, and digitize them and make them make them relevant, right? And these are real estate liens, bridal registries, kennel club records, credit records, convictions, you name it. Uh, Axiom, uh, who you've probably never heard of. Who's heard of Axiom before today? A few of you, right? Axiom estimates that it has about 1,500 records, distinct records, on every American over the age of 14. Uh, that's 1,500 pieces of information about you um, that you don't, know what it, you don't know what they are, but they've collected them from somewhere, everywhere. We, and, of course, what the private sector can do, the government can do, right? Uh, notably, many of these records are, in fact, private government records. So let me show you a last bit about the power here uh, to what drives this, because this is a true story um, that is derived from something that we, that we do at DHS, uh, which is the u analysis of data about people who are arriving in the United States. Uh, Dean Rawson mentioned it uh, in his introduction, <coughs> the automated targeting system, right? Uh, and this is the story of Raid Albania. Uh, Raid Albania is a Jordanian who is coming to the United States uh, through London on a Jordanian passport with a legitimate visa, all right? He arrived at Chicago's O'Hare Airport, where the automated targeting system had identified him as somebody who required additional inspection. Um, now, mind you, uh, important to say, it didn't identify that he was to be shot on sight or anything like that, or even denied entry. It was requiring additional inspection. He was taken to what's called secondary, where he was asked a bunch of questions by the, uh, in by the officer. Um, the answers didn't seem to match what the, what the data was, and he was eventually uh, denied entry. It happens, you know, hundreds of times a day for a whole host of reasons at borders everywhere in the United States. And he was sent back to Jordan. Uh, and that's his, uh, that's his uh, uh, mug shot or, uh, from that day. His fingerprints were taken and he was denied entry. Uh, the other photo is from a market in Iran, uh, where, uh, in, in Iraq rather, uh, where less than two years later, he drove a suicide vehicle loaded with uh, explosives into a crowded marketplace, killed 125 people. At the time, the most, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, largest such bombing um, that had happened in Iraq. A few more have been bigger now. And the only reason we know that it was him, and the only reason I can tell, I, the only reason I can tell this story, since most of these things are classified, is because he's dead now, so we can talk about him. And the only reason that we know it's him is because his hands were handcuffed to the steering wheel, uh, and he left behind a forearm in his hand, and we got the, and the uh, Iraqi government got the fingerprints off of the, off of the, uh, off of the hand that he left attached to the steering wheel. Um, so, yeah, that prospect is what drives and animates the government's interest in the power of this sort of data balance. Nobody, of course, can say for sure what Albania would have done had he come to the United States and been allowed to enter, right? You can't prove uh, a, con a counterfactual. Maybe he was just going to Disney World. Um, on the other hand, uh, given his subsequent history, uh, most people would say that this counts as a success in terms of, uh, of enhanced security for Americans. So all of that is by way of saying that there's a lot of power here. Uh, it's an inevitable uh, aspect of, uh, of technological progress. And the government has some pretty good reasons for wanting to be able to do stuff like that. Um, the problem is, of course, that in order to collect a lot of data about potential terrorists, you also collect a lot of data about innocent travelers. Everybody arriving in the United States has the automated targeting system used and analyzed to suggest whether or not they are subject to additional scrutiny. Um, that includes Americans, and it includes all foreigners. Uh, it, it's only, it works, by the way, only in the air environment, not so our Canadian friends don't have to worry about it when they cross the border uh, by land. Um, uh, so, but uh, but uh, you know, that's the case. So it violates what we think of as the right to privacy. Uh, now, in this context, it's useful to review, right? Uh, we, we've talked about this in the, first thing, in the first session, right? The right to privacy doesn't uh, apply to things you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in. And there's a long-term uh, Supreme Court set of precedents that goes back to the 70s uh, that says uh, records that you give up, like your bank records or your phone records, are things that you've exposed publicly, so you don't have a right to privacy. Today, there is no constitutional protection 
for those. Uh, whether that's a good thing or not, a different story, but as a factual statement, it's a, it's a true statement of today's law. Uh, the common law rights, yeah, in America, they go back to this famous article by uh, Sam Warren and, uh, and uh, Brandeis. Uh, if we have time at the end, I'll tell you a great story about Sam Warren. Um, but uh, historically, the common law right doesn't apply as against the government for law enforcement purposes. It's a private right against individuals who, who intrude upon your privacy. So again, no, no limitation. So such rights as we do have um, to protect us against governmental privacy intrusions are creatures only of statute. Things like the Privacy Act of 1974, the E-Government Act of 2002. All you need to know about the Privacy Act in this is that it was written in 1974, right? Uh, think of the arc of history since then uh, in, in terms of computer privacy to know that it, it in my, my thesis, is you know, our privacy laws are out of date and they don't match either the technology or the terrorist need. Um, our current privacy laws, a little bit of a summary, how am I doing on time, boss? Got about five minutes. Oh, this will probably go well. Um, uh, let me talk briefly about these two laws. Uh, the Privacy Act uh, has, yeah, is based upon something called the Fair Information Practices. And my apologies to Lee, who I, I know practices in this area and probably knows more about this than I do. But it basically has, as we heard from the EU, limitations on collection, how you can collect things, the, the, you can collect them only for specific purposes, can only be used for the purposes originally collected. There's a requirement of openness and transparency to the public. Individuals are supposed to be able to access the, their own records about themselves and correct them when they're wrong. Uh, and accountability, the audit principles that we were talking about in the last one as well. Likewise, the E-Government Act says that any time the government creates a big database, it should provide public notice about that. Uh, and, and specify the uses that it puts the data to. The problem is that neither of those laws fits what we actually do today, right? Terrorism analysis, the type of stuff that I was just talking about, isn't consistent with you know, the collection limitation or the purpose limitation or the use limitation, right? We collect, uh, th I mean, think of the first example. You collect uh, airplane reservation information for what purpose? For the purpose of making sure that the person who bought the ticket is the guy who gets on the flight, right? Uh, to make sure that, the, that your billing is correct, that, uh, that he gets into the right seat and that his frequent flyer number is, is, is correct. The con get the contact phone number to be able to call him in case the flight has changed, right? All of those are good business purposes for collecting it. And the government takes that data and uses it not for any of those purposes, but to find out whether or not you're, you're Muhammad Atta. Uh, or, uh, or something like that. So all of those purpose, all of those concepts don't fit how the government wants to use this sort of data today. Uh, openness and individual participation, it's almost impossible to think of a way to allow somebody to potentially access data about themselves for purposes of finding out whether or not they've been a hit on the terrorist watch list without telling them that, they're on, that we know that they're bad guys that are, shouldn't be on the terrorist watch list. These are, this is not, none of this is to say that these are bad principles. In fact, they're all very, very good principles. The problem is that none of them fit with what the government feels it needs to do in the concepts today, in, in the context of terrorism today. Likewise, in a world where there is no single system of databases, right, but just a bunch of distributed databases that are readily connected to each other through, uh, through internet connections. The idea of requiring notice when you create a single database is so readily avoidable by a government that wishes to do so uh, that the, the, the prohibition becomes almost meaningless. To be fair to the government, um, they actually voluntarily do it in cases in which uh, systems record notices are probably not legally required, precisely for transparency reasons, but yeah, you know, that leaves them uh, behind. So what I think we need to do is talk about new types. Come on, three minutes, three minutes, two minutes. We're getting together. Come on. Uh, new type. Ooh, that's weird. Um, so <laughs> uh, collection and analysis limitations are, I think, ineffective at this point, precisely because technology will overcome them. Uh, you cannot limit the amount of data that will be collected in any meaningful way, uh, given the pervasiveness of the internet today. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe you can construct workarounds that stop people for short term, but my prediction in the long term is it's, it, the, the technological changes are over. What I think we need to do, and this is actually an interesting point because it's, 
it's almost in direct disagreement with what Michael said in the last, in the last piece, so it's, it's worth talking about, is you need to talk about the consequence, right? Um, you need to talk about audits. You need to talk about uh, what sorts of scrutiny are bad sorts of scrutiny and what sorts of scrutiny are good sorts of scrutiny. Uh, there are questions here that nobody, know, that nobody has answered yet because we haven't thought about them concertedly. For example, is it better or worse that the review of data about you is automated? Right? Some people say it's better because there's no human intervention. Nobody sees it except this computer that discards the information if, you, if, the, if the analysis says there's no problem. Other people are deeply, deeply concerned about the prospect of automated uh, targeting. Uh, the idea that some computer is going to say who to be picked out, right? There's concepts of trade-offs here that we haven't talked about. This is all about f electronic privacy, right? Uh, or data privacy, if you will. But the trade-off is often going to be physical privacy. Are we going to, uh, if we get to a world where we don't do any data valence of people traveling on airplanes, uh, the natural inclination is going to be even worse uh, screening uh, at, the, at the TSA checkpoints for physical activity. Um, you know, and then there's the question of what's the right oversight mechanism. Uh, I, for one, think that, that audits and audit trails uh, actually do work. I've seen dozens of people at CBP fired for misusing the, the system in what would normally be minor offenses, uh, you know, uh, going outside the bounds of what they're supposed to do. I agree it's probably useful to do some real, uh, real data gathering on it, but my own experience is that it's pretty effective. Um, and then there are things that we haven't even begun to think about in terms of data balance. And here are two, and, these, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with these. Ah, I'll end with these. One is that information actually becomes better and more useful if there's more of it around. We've had horrible trouble with, uh, with the uh, uh, selectee lists with name matching, right? Anybody who heard the story of Teddy Kennedy knows that that was a, that that was a huge problem when this system was first set up. Um, the TSA is moving to a simpler system now in which you just use your name and your date of birth. And with those two pieces of information, all, most of the false positives, about 98% of the false positives, go away. Because though there are lots of Teddy Kennedys in the world, um, the Teddy Kennedy who we're worried about doesn't have the same birth date as the Teddy Kennedy who is the former senator of the, of the, uh, of the state of Massachusetts. And the final point I would make um, is that all of this really gets back to some fundamental concepts about deterrence. right? What is, what is it we talk about when we talk about deterrence in the criminal context? It's about the certainty of punishment. And if there's a low certainty of punishment, we want to have a very, very high uh, degree of, uh, of uh, stringency on the punishment that we impose. So if there's a 10% chance that we'll catch the robbers, we impose a 10-year a sentence on them to get an effective sentence of one year. Increasingly, with more data, CCTVs, for example, for uh, cameras that watch speeders. The certainty of punishment is going through the roof now. We now are, you know, if you're, if you're caught by a camera, your chances of, they make mistakes about 2% of the time. And that means we're going to have to think a little bit about lowering our concepts of what constitutes a crime and how much punishment should be imposed. Those were my thinking points that I was going to end with for discussion. And uh, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, thanks for these two stimulating talks, and we've got about uh, 20 minutes for questions. So I'm sure there will be. Yes? Um, okay. you got to wait, for, wait, wait, for, the, the wait for the microphone. You'll be surveilled as you speak yeah, into the microphone. We're all surveilled. You can tell. Uh, just come. Well, okay. You, you, you just pointed out this, this thing with um, the – the data is more useful if you, if you have a lot of it. But, but yet I have heard uh, the, the criticism that uh, if, you, if you have a lot of data and, you, and you're searching for, for, for one suspect, uh, that it's like uh, trying to find an, a needle in, in a haystack mm -hmm. rather than if you... Um, if you if you just go by probable cause, um, 
then it's like it, 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 it makes it easier be, because you, you, you're working with, um, with, a, a, with, with limited information, but it's, it, it's just a heck of a lot ac more accurate. Um, thank you for that. That's a, that's a, a great question. Uh, there are two pieces to the answer to that. Um, the first is that uh, part of the answer lies in, in the data about the efficacy of computer processing power. You know, it may be like looking for a needle in a haystack, but if you can search 10 million haystacks in a second to find your needle, that makes it easier. Um, the other piece of it, and this is, this is where um, uh, I get, my apology at the start really needs to be reemphasized because concepts like this and computational concepts like this are, are actually beyond me in, in many ways. I'm a lawyer. Um, is, is there's this whole field of computational uh, uh, work in the computer field called knowledge discovery um, that is used a, a by, uh, by computer uh, experts who try and find and mine out patterns of data um, that they say uh, prove, uh, demonstrates that in some cases, not in all, because uh, uh, more data actually makes it easier, more hay actually makes it easier to find the needle. And the, the uh, example that I have always been given, and that makes this kind of an easy one to, um, uh, to talk about, is, uh, is the pattern of fraud uh, that was discovered by the knowledge discovery people working for banks. Um, it involved the discovery that, be, that for stolen credit cards, before, um, before a person who had stolen your credit card would use it at Best Buy to buy you know, a $10,000 TV system, he would go to the um, gas station and make a small uh, purchase of gasoline using the card. And the reason gas stations were chosen uh, was because they're anonymous, right? You don't see anybody. You stick the card in the machine, and if the card is rejected, you just go away. Um, uh, and so uh, what they discovered from this data pile was this pattern, and that explains why uh, nowadays, if you, make, if you buy some gasoline before you go on your way to the Best Buy, you may very well find a hold on your credit card. It also explains why... Um, I don't know if they have this here in Ohio, but in Washington they've started requiring us to put in our, our uh, zip code uh, on the machines because they figure that the guy who stole the card won't know your zip code, uh, but you will. Uh, and so that's a way of authorizing it. All of that is an example of a pattern discovery through knowledge discovery that turns on computational mechanics that, uh, you know, the details of which, frankly, just utterly elude me. Other questions? So, Ted. There's a question for David Lyon. Um, isn't the sleeper issue in the United States uh, for the national ID card is the number of illegal immigrants who are in the United States? And we can't throw them out, uh, uh, 12 million of them, in one swoop. And uh, won't that be the result if we have a national ID card system? I happen to think that uh, many of these um, uh, illegal immigrants are caught in, this, in a system of very, very slow processing, uh, great lines of, and backups and so on, where they can't get uh, legal, they can't get a, a, some official to uh, legalize them. And uh, so it would cause a certain amount of, um, not only would it be unrealistic because many of these illegal immigrants per perform valuable services in this country, even though they are low level, but it would also be very inequitable. Mm -hmm. You talked, you alluded a little bit about that when you talked about citizenship and the exclusion. Yep. Well, I mean, that, that's a really good comment. I said there's a whole range of uh, rationales for developing national ID systems around the world. Uh, security, I just mentioned, because that happens to be the prominent one in Canada and the United States. But uh, they're always in combination with others. And uh, in a globalizing world where there's an increasing uh, mobility between countries, then yeah, it's, a, it's an obvious reason why people would want to have some kind of national system. Or not or not want to have one. I mean, it, yeah, it, it goes both ways. Over here. 
Thank you. Um, my question is for uh, Mr. Rosenzweig. Uh, you had mentioned that the statutory frameworks uh, weren't really keeping up with what the government wants to do, particularly with respect to the, the data usage and the data analysis and collection. Um, and so my question is this. Um, you, you had said that it was inconsistent and ineffective and, and those laws were, those statutes were somewhat out of date. So my question is this. Is the automated targeting system as it's currently functioning, is it in breach of the Privacy Act and the E-Government Act? And I also wanted to add that I think that the automated targeting system, the land crossing functioning, um, is actually operational at the Canadian border now. So it's not just in the in the air environment. So if you could maybe comment on those two issues. Thank you. Sure. Let me take the last one first. Um, the automated targeting system has six modules. Um, it does not operate in a passenger-specific module on uh, the uh, land border with Canada unless they've turned it on in the last two months and I didn't notice um, or read about it. What it operates, uh, the other modules are a cargo module that's both inbound and outbound cargo, which does operate on the, on the northern border, um, and a license plate scanning module that does operate on the borders with Canada and with Mexico. Uh, but in terms of the passenger analysis stuff that I was talking about, it doesn't, it, it doesn't operate. As for uh, whether or not ATS is in violation of the Privacy Act, uh, the answer is no. Um, and one of the pieces that I thought I said, and if I didn't, it was only because I was running out of time, is that you know, in the Privacy Act, there's a law enforcement exemption that you can basically drive a, a truck through um, uh, in many instances uh, for data systems that are collected for law enforcement purposes. Um, it's the same is true, actually, in the European Union with the directive that we were talking about. The European Court of Justice um, you know, concluded that, that the, the targeting system should be judged underneath, under their uh, 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 law enforcement authorities, not under the transportation authorities. So um, uh, there's actually on the DHS website a uh, privacy impact assessment, a PIA for ATS that's about you know 70 or 80 pages long uh, that goes through the details of the analysis. Um, the the upshot of which is that they've tried to, um, uh, Cypre, right? The, uh, the doctrine of Cypre coming close. Uh, they've tried to adopt as many of the principles of, of the Privacy Act as they can into the ATS uh, as a, a, and, and been transparent about the ones that they have adopted and ones that they haven't. Uh, so at least there's an open public discussion about it. But the conclusion of the privacy officer at DHS was that it, it doesn't violate um, the Privacy Act. And, and I, I think that's probably right. Or I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. I actually have a question on the information sharing aspect of this in that alongside Moore's law is as a founding principle of the digital age is the premise of garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've had reason in the last uh, few months to look at a number of commercial databases with information about me and I was really surprised at the amount of really bad information, both historical and mm -hmm. current, that was there. Uh, is there a technological solution to this? Or, uh, and of course, you've got immensely unresponsive bureaucracies, many of which are private bureaucracies, but will also refuse to disclose their rating criteria and selection criteria. Uh, what are the challenges and threats of this, both for, uh, you know, which I think, Ted, operate as part of the resistance of American citizens to the idea of a national ID card? That's also a great question. Uh, it, it, um, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, the data, the analysis is only as good as, as the information you have. There are, well, the government systematically has adopted uh, two, two answers to this, and then I think Lee is waving his hand over there because he wants to, to jump in on this. Um, the, 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 systematic, the two systematic answers are, um, in, in almost all systems that I'm aware of, certainly all the homeland security systems I'm aware of, the consequence of identification in the government is not an automatic imposition of a limitation on a benefit or a right, or, or, but uh, uh, actually just the heightened scrutiny, the going to secondary. So that, um, so one answer to this is because you're, you're a suspect about your data, you limit the consequences that flow from reliance on the data. Um, the other piece of it, and this you can see in the, um, 
uh, Information Sharing Environment Privacy Guidelines, www.ise.gov, and you know, follow the links and you'll get there, is a pretty concerted effort to put in place processes that require um, uh, agencies that contribute information to the, in, uh, to the information sharing environment, which is the only one I'm really familiar with, um, to go back and scrub their data, right? Now, you can uh, deride government processes like that, and, you know, they're not going to be 100 percent effective. Nobody's going to tell you that uh, by any stretch of the imagination. On the other hand, um, it does reflect a systematic recognition of that very problem and and an effort. I mean, you know, when the government puts in place a process and people get graded on, get their raises and their bonuses and get graded on uh, adherence to the process, the process has effects. It doesn't have the same comprehensive effects that you or I would want, but it, it is, it, I mean, system, systematizing it has, is, will, I think, in the long run be a help. My concern actually there is less with government databases oh, than with the commercial ones. Uh, that I have uh, no information about. <laughs> that I have no. Hi. Uh, so I'm, uh, I will have to ask the question as to ATS with respect to accountability and, and oversight. I mean, as you probably know, Paul, we, EFF, had an you know, outstanding FOIA request with, with uh, uh, the government, DHS on ATS. And, you know, we got a lot of couple thousand pages of heavily redacted documents which are not at all very uh, clear about many of the details that one would like to know. Uh, but so but rather than get into sort of the weeds about what was or wasn't told, the, the question I have for you is how do you or how would you gauge or how would you say we should as a, as a, a public actually have an under, how much know, should we know about how it's used? How much should we know about the data that's in it? For instance, uh, on the accuracy thing, right? Apparently, anyone only has a right to see the information they themselves have voluntarily provided, or well, not voluntarily, have provided into the system via uh, uh, their passenger records, et cetera, et cetera. They certainly don't have a right to as I understand, to see any data that was provided, uh, that was obtained through other means. So in terms of the accuracy of the inputs question, um, how, is, how are we supposed to be assured, uh, how are we supposed to verify that there is any level, what the le aggregate level of accuracy is in the system is, and so on. I mean, what's, what's the way uh, to have an effective oversight mechanism on this when uh, you're talking about, what, seven different agencies that are pumping information into it. Some of it is terrorist screening da database stuff. Some of it is Treasury Enforcement Communication System stuff. A lot of highly classified databases that, are, uh, that I'm sure I don't know about. Um, and all in all, it's being deployed at the border and then, you know, at point of contact. Gee, am I, my laptop's being searched because I hit a certain score or some combination of a flag in the system that t directs the agent to do something. And I mean, at every point, especially at the border uh, of contact, I'm facing this. I, I don't know why, but the government is about to like suck data out of, you know, out of my device. I mean, these are, I mean, to, to us at least, these are really serious issues. And yet we have really no oversight mechanism that that seems to matter here, and that just seems to be an unacceptable situation. Did you want an answer to that? Or, or I, yeah, um, I, I mean, that's a, a great question, and, and the transparency of oversight is, is in my personal view, the, the $24 question, or the 24 carat question, or the million dollar question, whatever. I, I, $64,000 question, thank you very much. Um, I'm old enough to yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm, I, I hope, I hope I'm not, but, uh, um, and as yet, I don't think we have found a cohesive answer. Um, it is, to me, it seems ineluctable uh, uh, and indisputable that we're not going to ever get to a point where you get to know what the, the CIA's file on you is, if the CIA has one on you, um, 
uh, that is uh, that has collected data about you, um, because that is so likely to have come from some classified source that you, you're just not going to be able to get to that. Um, we are struggling with the middle case, which is um, law enforcement records. Right now, access to that is exceedingly limited. Um, I actually have a strong, a relatively strong view that that should be opened up. That uh, you know, criminal re your criminal records um, uh, ought to be uh, matters of disclosable to you. Uh, uh, if collected from the San Francisco police or something like that. Um, but what I think in the end is the only feasible solution, and we are working our way towards this, is a series of um, substituted transparencies, graduated transparencies, which is to say that in the end, uh, because of the nature of classified information in national security, the public is going to have to come to grips with delegating its oversight authority to somebody it trusts. You know, whether, you know, that, you know the ideal place would be Congress, right? That, you know, that, I, that I could talk, yeah, you're laughing because we both agree that that's kind of hard. But in an idealized world, we could say, I have elected representatives. They are on the House Homeland Security Committee and the House Intelligence Committee and the House Armed Services Committee, and they are fully advised and if they say it's okay, I'm going to have to trust them. Um, we laugh because, you know, the politics of America is so polarized that that's, that's um, uh, uh, an unrealistic expectation. So that not succeeding, we move to uh, privacy officers uh, in, in DHS and in, and in DOJ and in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, uh, who, um, uh, you know, some will say, okay, they're too much inside, right? They're, they're, they're part of the system, so they're half in, half out. That's not enough. So we move to the next level. We create a Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, um, as yet unstaffed uh, by either the last or this administration, but to be completely independent of, uh, of any agency that it oversees with subpoena power. Um, in the UK, um, they sometimes go have a system of designating a monitor from one of the opposing parties uh, for preventative detention, for example. It's a guy named Lord Carlisle, who's a Queen's counsel for the Liberal Democrats, who files a report every year on, uh, after looking at everything, on whether or not the 35 people who are currently in, in preventative detention in the UK uh, are appropriately so. And he doesn't say everything that he saw. He can't. But he, he, people tend to think that his judgment is good, and they tend to seem to accept it. Uh, you know, none of those are perfect. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a clutch, right? Um, uh, but I think it, it's an inevitable consequence of the nature of the subject matter and the issues behind it that it's going to have to be a clutch. That's unfortunate. Do you want to respond to this, and then we'll take one last question? Yeah, a couple of, couple of um, comments coming out of the last several questions. Um, although there's a, there's a tension here, I think that the, um, the conversation is going in the right direction because so many so-called privacy laws and some data protection laws tend to put the onus on the individual to know uh, when their privacy has been violated, to know where to go, all, all that sort of thing. There's that kind of responsabilization that, oh, well, if there's a problem, it's on the part of the person who has been violated. They have to do something about it. The fact that we're talking about the accountability of the organizations that uh, actually process these data, I think is crucially important, and that's the right direction to go, even though there's still a tension there. But I think there's a bigger kind of cultural issue here, too, that uh, we haven't got time to go into the historical reasons why it's come about, but I think Catherine Hales is right to say that information has lost its body. In other words, we have allowed ourselves to get into a situation where personal data that are circulating all the time are frequently considered not in relation to the actual flesh and blood people that they refer to, but as if they could operate on their own. And this is where we come to the question of uh, garbage in, garbage out, trivial data. I'll give you a couple of, of examples, one on the commercial side. Um, all those uh, trivial bits of data that uh, Paul was discussing that to Axiom use. Say you're uh, applying for a driver's license in Britain. 
Uh, obviously, they'll go through the usual things. Has this person been disqualified? Do they have points against them? All that sort of thing. But once they've been through that, then the license application goes off to Experian, which is like Axiom. It's a data broker company. And from Experian, they will work out a trust score on each individual applicant. And that trust score will be dependent on all sorts of things. For example, if you uh, have more to do with mail order companies than with clearing banks, then you will be lower on the trust score. So those apparently trivial bits of data end up uh, giving you a different level on the trust score, and that will determine the speed at which your application uh, goes to the next stage. Mm. So this is what I mean by they are very obscure criteria and not ones that ordinary people have a sense of, you know, what's going on at all. But the other aspect of the, uh, the trivial data, uh, in the Canadian case, and I like everyone in this room, I'm sure we do want to find ways of uh, resisting violent activities. So this is not to do with uh, loving terrorism. If you look at the other side of the coin and look at those people who have been apprehended wrongly in relation to some supposed terrorist uh, inclinations, then the picture is... is also dependent on small bits of information. But uh, I had to write a background report this year for a uh, Toronto law firm on uh, uh, three Canadians, Al Malki, Al Mati, and Nuruddin. And these, these three characters were uh, apprehended and were subject to extraordinary rendition, and all three were tortured in Syria and in Egypt for their supposed connections to terrorism. All three of them were completely innocent, uh, just ordinary Canadian citizens like uh, the rest of us. And um, the kinds of data that were involved included, for example, a map of Ottawa with strategic sites marked on it that uh, was found on the, uh, in, the, in the truck that uh, El Marti had been driving. Well, as it happened, it wasn't even a map that he was using. It was the previous driver who'd been using it. But nonetheless, that trivial bit of data got into the system, got into the database, and eventually it was uh, discovered three years after the torture had taken place that the map was actually a tourist map of Ottawa. And the point of having strategic sites, the key sites in Ottawa, were that it was a guide to the city. Mm -hmm. So... You know, the trivial information that garbage in, there was more than garbage out. Those three characters have had their lives ruined, their health has ru been ruined, their relationships have been ruined. And this is what I'm meaning about information losing its body. You know, you have these trivial little bits of data and you completely forget, because of the historical reasons we haven't got time to go into, that they're connected with real life individuals. And that, it seems to me, is a much bigger kind of cultural issue that we have to address on multiple levels, not just legal or technical or whatever. It's, it's, it's an educational matter. It's a matter of awareness. A final question which we can at least pose even if we carry the answering into uh, the lunch period. It, it's not even a question. It's addition to David who psychically read my mind on what I was going to say. Um, I, I just suggest that in, on the basis of that, coming from, a Canada, coming, coming from a country where our citizens have been tortured on the basis of data valence garbage, um, I would like to say that the, the paradigm we should be talking about is the difference between a concept of national security and one of personal security. Let's use the same language because it's absolutely the same thing. It's not privacy as an abstract against national security, which seems to weight the whole discussion in a way that seems quite trivializing of the personal interests that are involved, which are no less about security um, than the first paradigm. So that's what I wanted to add on to Dave's. Thanks. Thank you, and many thanks to the panel for uh, stimulating the discussion. Thank you. That was fun. Head outside and then we'll find it. We, we head outside for lunch and, and we find it here.